I've been into consumer electronics for as long as I can remember, but back in the 1980s, in the days before the World Wide Web and even before the gadget magazines, finding out about the latest and greatest products actually required a bit of legwork. You had to go and look around the stores to see what new things they got on display. So every few weeks I'd take the bus to my local town and have a wander around the electronic stores there. Perhaps the best one they had was a Dixon's. Now, every now and then, a couple of times a year, I'd get the opportunity to go to my nearest city. And they had a few more stores, most notably for me, Lasky's, which was like a more upmarket Dixon's. They had some better quality things in there. And they also had a Boots sound and vision department. Now, Boots is a chemist, and most people nowadays just know it as that. But back in the 1980s, they sold music and computer games and electronics, amongst other things. And in this catalogue here, which, by the way, I picked these up just to have my own little version of the internet, I suppose. When I visited the stores, these were like a memento, and I'd go home and I'd look through these very closely, thinking one day I'm going to own one of these. Well, one day has come now, because this 1985 catalogue on page 23 features the thing that I'm going to show you today. It's the Sony FH7 Mark II, and 33 years after I picked this catalogue up, I finally got one. So let's take a look at it. So here's the page out of that 1985 catalogue and you'll see at the top left there they've classified these compact hi-fis as shelf systems. The FH7 Mark II is the one at the bottom right. And whilst, just like the other devices on the page, it is a compact hi-fi, it does one thing that the other ones don't and that's that it's designed to be portable. It comes with a handle. Although, the fact it's got a handle doesn't mean it's the kind of thing that a b-boy is going to be carrying around on their shoulder along with a rolled up piece of lino under the other arm because this is a heavy device. If you look at the bottom there, the weight is 15.1 kilograms, which is approximately 33 pounds. So whilst it's portable, it's only portable in the sense that you lift it up and lug it to another location, at which point you then plug it into a wall power supply. However, if you really wanted to power it away from a plug socket, you could. You'd just have to buy this optional DC power supply unit that enabled you to run the device from either a car battery or this would hold 12 D cells. Can you just imagine the weight of that when combined with the rest of the hi-fi? Now, this unit would swap out the existing power supply on the bottom of the hi-fi. And if you're running it off batteries, it would output at a lower volume to conserve the energy. You can see at the top there, the maximum output that's listed is one of the big selling features of this. It's a very loud little hi-fi, but yes, if you're running it off batteries, it would be at a lower volume, but those batteries would last for approximately 12 hours if they were alkalines. You can also see there are a couple of additional colors available. We've seen the black one and the silver one on the left there, the red one on the right. I think they only sold that in certain territories. You're much more common to see either the silver or the black. Now, going back to that 1985 cat, Slog. It's the most expensive hi-fi that the store sold at the time. You can see at the bottom here, it's £420 approximately. So let's see what that converts to with inflation nowadays. And it comes out at about £1,286. So you can see it was a very expensive little hi-fi. That, by the way, converts to about US$1,674. However, despite the premium price, I believe this was a very successful product for Sony at the time, and they sold a lot of them. But all these years later, trying to find one that's fully working and in good condition could take you quite some time. It certainly took me quite a while, but I managed to find this one for sale in Germany, and the advert made it look very good. It said it had been refurbished as well, so hopefully it's functioning properly. And as you can see, the guy has done a really good job here of packing it up. All the individual components are packed separately. It's even included the service manual. We can see I've got the handle here and the all important metal brackets for the side, which not only hold the speakers to the device, but also hold all the components together. Right, so let's start putting this together bit by bit. Now, I've never owned one of these before, so I'm looking at the pictures here just to make sure I'm doing everything in the right order. We start off with the amplifier at the bottom there. You can see this is the cassette deck, and on the bottom of here, we've got four rubber feet, which line up with four indentations on the top of the amplifier. So when you put one thing on top of the other, they line up perfectly. 
Now, I think there are some of these components that the device would still work without. For example, the cassette deck, you could get rid of that. But this next one, you would definitely need one of these. This is the graphic equalizer, the source selector, and the volume control. And you can see these ribbon cables are attached into the back of there, which connect up with the other devices in the stack. Now again, the next thing is the radio tuner. I suppose you could get by without one of these as well, although it would be a bit of a shame not to include it. It's got the proprietary connectors on the back which attach up to those ribbon cables. So everything is in a nice stack now. Let's just attach the things up to each other. You can see there's quite a bit of spare ribbon cable here and the reason for that is you don't have to have everything in a tall stack. You could separate these components out and have them side by side. You might have noticed that on some of the pictures earlier on. Now this ribbon cable came inside the box. Each Part of this is labelled up for the component it plugs into. So at the top it says ST78, that's the stereo tuner at the top. And then the next one goes into the graphic equaliser and source selector. And then it goes down to the bottom and into the amplifier. And you can tidy the ribbon cables away in these channels which have got a clip on either side just to keep everything nice and neat. So the next thing I'm going to do is put the metal brackets on the side. So these have the two jobs, holding it all together and also these are the things that you clip the speakers onto. I was glad to see the chap who sold this to me kept the screws for the brackets in the components themselves so they couldn't get lost. So once I've unscrewed those, I can now put the bracket up against the side of this and it all lines up very nice and neatly. And it's just a matter of putting these screws into the top and the bottom and then spinning it around, doing the same on the other side. And of course, once I've got it all in there, tightening it up with a screwdriver. So just a matter of putting the speakers on there. You can see these already have the brackets on the inside of them. So those just slide over the top of the brackets on the side of the components and drop into place. Now the handle serves two functions. Number one, obviously it's a handle, but number two, once you've clipped it onto the top of here, it holds everything in place. Those speakers can't slide up anymore once that handle's been clipped down. But when you try and lift this up, especially in front of you like this, rather than at your side, you realize how heavy this really is. Just because it's got a handle on the top doesn't mean it's the kind of thing you'd enjoy carrying. But anyway, I'll just plug these speakers into here and you might notice there's something a little bit odd going on. If you haven't, I'll explain more in a moment. Now, I was wondering what was behind this compartment on the back, and it turns out it's two leaky batteries. I really don't know how long these have been here. Now, I wasn't expecting it to need any batteries because it doesn't have a clock on here and there are no presets for the radio. But the reason that it uses two AA batteries is to hold the last station that you were listening to so that when you turn it on again later, it carries on from that frequency. Anyway, I cleaned all that out and I've replaced it with two new batteries. And yes, they're Kirkland batteries. And yes, they're from Costco. And yes, we do have Costco here in the UK. I'll start it off with something easy. We'll just have a listen to the radio. Okay, let's up the jeopardy a little bit. I'll cross my fingers and hope for the best and try the cassette deck. Well, I'm glad to say it's working fine, although I'm going to give it a good clean, not just the heads, but all the rest of the mechanism as well, because I've noticed there are these what look like small black hairs in here. Perhaps this has been in a barber's at some point, but it definitely needs cleaning out. Now, I'll show you around it properly in a moment, but you might have noticed there are three buttons on the right here to select different sources. We've got tape, tuner and phono. Or is that phono? People always tell me I'm saying it wrong. But anyway, it's for these inputs on the back for a phonograph for a record player. What kind of record player? Well, the Sony PSQ5 and Q7, Q9 for that matter. The little record player on the top here. If that looks familiar, it's because I've got one of those and you've seen it, if you've seen some of my earlier videos, quite a few times now. In fact, that's the reason I ended up getting this hi-fi. I got it back in, I think, 2014 and I showed it in this... 4K video, the first 4K video I uploaded onto YouTube just as a, a demo video. And ever since then, I've been looking for the hi-fi that that record player should sit on the top of. So now I've got it, I can put the record player on it, and finally, it's in its rightful home. 
So I've plugged this into the input on the back and I've also plugged it into a separate wall power supply. The record player doesn't draw its power from the rest of the components. You do need to use two plugs to power all of this, but it really just sets it all off perfectly. This is taking me right back to the mid 1980s and walking into hi-fi stores like Lasky's where they'd usually have the lights down a little bit low in the hi-fi section so you could see all these LEDs flashing on the various components and I'll talk you through the components that make up this unit in a moment. But before I get to that there's just one more thing that I'd like to try on the top of here. You see at the point when this was out in the stores 1984-1985 that was when compact disc was starting to take off. So as well as this record player that you could buy and have on the top of here, Sony also released a compact disc player that matched the rest of the components. It's the CDP-7F. Now, unfortunately, I don't have one of those. I've got one of Sony's other small compact disc players that you might have spotted in one of my earlier videos. It doesn't quite match the components here. It's really designed for one of the other FH range of mini hi-fis but it works the same way that you have to plug it into the front there. The auxiliary input is on the front next to the graphic equalizer and the phono, phono button is also the CD auxiliary button. So if you do decide to try and run a CD player and a record player on here, the only way you're going to be able to switch between them is by pulling that plug out of the front. So really you do want to decide whether you're going to use one or the other. Probably not both though. Although perhaps it's my appreciation for the absurd, which makes me really like the way this looks once everything's in this giant stack. But of course, in reality, you wouldn't tend to have it like this. You would either have the record player on the top or perhaps the compact disc with them both being top loaders. But let's go back and have a look at the difference between the different models. You see, I've got the FH7 Mark II. Well, how does that differ from the Mark I? Well, here's a picture of a Mark I. Unfortunately, it's a silver one, so it looks a little bit different to start with, but that isn't the difference, really. It's the features. First off, the graphic equaliser on the first one doesn't have LEDs in the sliders, whereas on the Mark II it does. So I think that really adds something to it. I know it's only a little thing, but still. The radio on the first one has FM, medium wave, and long wave, whereas the Mark II has FM, medium wave, and two short wave bands. The first one auto senses between four different types of tape, type one, type two, type three, and type four. By the time the Mark II came out, it's dropped the sensor for the type three. So it just does type one, type two, and type four. There was also an FH7 Mark III. Now I haven't seen very many of these for sale, so I'm guessing they didn't sell or make as many as they did of the previous ones. Now the Mark III, has three-way speakers on it that are also angled out a little bit to give a wider stereo sound stage compared to the, the previous models, which both had two-way speakers. But there are another couple of differences that I can see from looking at these pictures. First off, there's a microphone input on this one to the left of the graphic equalizer, which has shifted up the CD and auxiliary input up to the radio tuner at the top there. And I've got to guess that that means that the auxiliary and phono inputs operate differently now because the auxiliary input has been moved to the tuner button on the front there. But again, there's not an awful lot of difference between all of them, although you might have noticed something that's a little bit wrong with mine, and it's at either side of it. And it's the speakers. They're the wrong speakers. And yes, they're not just the wrong colour, they're the wrong speakers entirely. These are the ones that should be on an FH7 Mark II with that red logo on there and the black bar across the middle and those are the ones that are on mine and it turns out that my speakers my silver speakers for my black stereo unit are actually off a mark one so what somebody's done here they've got the center part they've managed to find a couple of speakers that will fit but they are off a mark one rather than a mark two now initially when i saw the pictures of this for sale i hadn't noticed that it all just kind of looked okay so i wasn't too upset because i still got a decent quality unit and i could have lived with those silver speakers on there they don't even look all that noticeable from the front but i decided to carry on shopping and see if i could ever find any speakers that match mine and i managed to find some guy selling a broken fh7 mark ii on ebay but it looked like his speakers were in good condition. So I got in touch with him, put him an offer in just for the speakers, and he sent those to me, and then he was able to sell the rest of it on separately. 
and you can see here that the color of the speaker is also extended to the color of the bracket that goes on there as well and looking at the front here they look pretty similar but there's quite a bit of difference between them the mark ii has a square driver on there whereas the mark one had a round cone behind a square panel Having a square driver meant that more of the front of the speaker was the driver unit and therefore the APM 078, the speakers for the Mark II, go up to 76 watts maximum, that's at 6 ohm, whereas the ones for the Mark I, they only got to 60 watts, so I could have potentially, I suppose, blown my speakers out if I hadn't realised. Now, I did take a bit of a gamble on these speakers. I've got no idea whether they were any good, and I was hoping they didn't have any dints in the grills and things. And I'm happy to say they don't, but they are pretty dirty. It looks like they got splattered with some paint at some point. Now, I tested a bit of this isopropyl alcohol on a spot on the back just to make sure it wasn't going to do anything to the finish, and it didn't, but it did manage to remove those spots of white paint. And you can see here how dirty these speakers are as well. By the way, they're wood boxes on these. They're not plastic speakers like you get on most boom boxes because it really isn't a boom box it's more of a, a small component system but there we go that's what it looks like with the correct speakers in place and I've got to say it does look a, a lot better now so all the things you've just seen took place over approximately six months but now that I've got everything together I can show you around this in a little bit more detail Triple up on it, then make sure y'all get a good dose of it. And so the haters don't keep too close to it. I leave style in your eye like lashes. Now, given that this wasn't a cheap device when it came out, it does have a few premium features on here. Not too many, though. It does have auto reverse on the cassette deck. So when it reaches the end of one side, it will then play the other with a nice indicator light below the reels there to show what direction the tape is moving in. If you want, you can get it to play when it reaches the beginning of a tape after rewinding it by holding down the play and rewind key at the same time. It's got just Dolby B noise reduction on here though and it doesn't have a recording level control, it's an automatic recording level so the VU meter that's on the cassette deck here could be considered perhaps there just for show. goes very loud, so loud that I could feel the air getting moved by the speakers. tape indicator lights on the left here probably aren't necessary but they just add a little bit of visual flair to the machine so you can see here that's a type 1 tape if I put in a chrome tape which has the notch cut out on the top that will identify as a type 2. The radio is perhaps a little bit bare bones but back when this came out digital tuners were still a relative rarity now the way this one works is you hold down the plus and minus to move through the frequencies slowly but hold the fast button as well to move a little bit quicker although as i mentioned earlier on there are no presets on this one survey what songs you love tell us what songs you don't love and a hundred pounds could be yours if we pull your name out of the hat up to this point in the video, I've had it all set up in this vertical configuration with the brackets on the side, the speakers clipped onto it, the handle on the top, but really that's designed more for moving it around. I'd imagine if I had this in my house back in the day, I would have spaced those speakers out a little bit more, had it all laid out like this. And now that I've got it like this, I've got to say, that looks gorgeous. I know you're probably sick of hearing people say they don't make things like they used to, but when it comes to things like this they definitely don't so I'm not saying that they need to either this is something from the past but I'm just glad that they did make it at one point and I've managed to finally get hold of one anyway that's it for the moment as always thanks for watching Now, while the FH7 couldn't really be classified as a boombox, it's about the nearest thing that I've featured to one of those in a video so far. Although in the future, I do intend to feature some boomboxes like this one that needs a bit of a refurb. But this seems like the best opportunity so far that I've had to mention this thing that was sent to me by a viewer recently. 
This comes from Max in Germany and it's a 2019 calendar and each month features a different picture of a boombox located around Berlin. Now apparently there's only 250 of these being made and mine is number 007. So if you want to get hold of one of these, this is just a free plug for him. I'll put a link to his website in the video description text box. 